Okay, it started. Okay, should we start now? Okay, I'm gonna get started. So first we're gonna import pandas. So uh, remember from last time we imported it like this. Um, then, so you can see I have my data sets here. I have diabetes and I have doctor. Um, so I'm gonna import both of them. So I'll just import this as diabetes data frame equals pd.read read csv. Uh, and we'll do diabetes.csv. Uh, then I'll do uh, doctors.cs uh, CSV. I'll import that as well. So uh, pd.read CSV, uh, and we'll do uh, doctors. Okay, there we go. Uh, so if I just quickly um, output what's on diabetes DF, you can see that you have a bunch of different factors. If, uh, I want to see the exactly which factors you have. You can see these are all the columns. Um, so you have patient ID, pregnancies, plasma glucose, diastolic 
blood pressure, uh, triceps, tricep th thickness, uh, serum, insulin, BMI, the diabetes pedigree, age, and whether they are diabetic. This is going to be zeros and ones. So, like, if you're using this for a machine learning data set, you might uh, use some of these, uh, we would call them features, and you might use some of them to predict if the person is diabetic or not. Um, so th that's like an uh, example. Uh, then we also have the uh, doctor's uh, data frame. So right here, this one just has the patient IDs which match up with these patient IDs, uh, and then the physician that um, is working with these patients. So yeah, that, that's all the features that are in this data set. So what we'll see today, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna learn about this function called group by, and uh, it's a pretty powerful function. You can use it to well, group your data by certain factors, uh, as the name would suggest, and then we'll go into melt, uh, into reshaping the data a little bit. Um, and then uh, at the very end, um, I'm expecting that we will probably finish early. So then we're gonna do some basic command line usage. Um, and uh, Ryan will be posting the attendance form shortly. Uh, and also, Ryan, uh, you're on your personal account on Twitch, by the way. Uh, okay, so um, first, let's just, uh, so the group by function, uh, it allows you to group the data frame into basically a data frame of data frames. Uh, and then you can do stuff with that data. So first, let's, uh, so it's going to create a, sorry, not into a data frame, but it's, I'll call it a group by object, but it, you can basically think of it as a data frame. Data frame. So uh, what it does, is, so we can uh, convert it into a list. That way we can actually understand what it's doing a little bit better. Uh, so we're going to do diabetes DF, and we're going to group by, and we can group by the age feature. Um, so there we go. And you can see, so what it, what you'll see, okay, this is gonna take a long time to scroll, but what you'll see is that uh, it'll take the um, person's age, so you can see right here, this is like 77, 76, uh, and it'll look at all the patients that are under that age group, and it'll give you all their information for those uh, age groups. So you can see 75, 74, 73, so on. Um, and so we can, here's an easier way to see the data. So uh, we can do group key and group value. So for group key and group value in diabetes uh, df dot group by age. So we're still grouping by the age and we're just gonna iterate this through a loop, right? Um, so we'll say, so uh, then we'll say print group key and print group value. So, okay, what you'll see here is, you see how this is a tuple, uh, where the first one is, well, it's not really a tuple, but it'll basically return like a tuple. So the first one is gonna be the actual, uh, is gonna be the age of the, of the group that we're talking about. And then the rest of it right here is like the, the data for it. So you'll see whenever we print this, uh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Once we print this, uh, sorry. Looks like I made a typo. There we go. Right here, I put a, I forgot to put a U right here. Okay, there we go. So, okay, that's. So there you go. Now you can see this better. You can see 77, and you can see the thing. Uh, and then also, if you want to just see the key, you can comment this line out. And now you can see just all the ages. Uh, we could comment the other way around, but I'm not sure how helpful that would be because you just get the uh, you would just get the data right here, and you wouldn't really know which age that is. Um, but that's just to help you visualize what exactly it's it's doing. Um, so now what we can do with this is we can actually aggregate the data. So if I there's probably a few lines there, but probably would have been better. Okay, anyways. Uh, diabetes df dot group by uh, well group by the age sorry uh, group by the age um, and then we're gonna run the size function on this so you can see what it does is it's gonna say okay look uh, in the age group 21 we'll have two two thousand five hundred fifty six um, twenty two we have two thousand four hundred eighty six data sets uh, data points. Uh, this total, this data set, I think, has like 15,000 patients in it. So you can see that like majority of it is in the younger patients. 
and then we ha as you go up like here you have some a uh, few patients uh, here there's like a few more patients but um, a lot of them seem to be at the younger age uh, you could also get this by the value counts um, but uh, this is in a different data type so okay so then what we can do with this is we can apply this function called the aggregate function uh, and we can get uh, we can apply functions on these groups so we can apply a min function right so what this will do is it's going to take the age so in this case 21 and then patient ID won't very be very useful in this case but what it does is it since we apply the min function it'll take the minimum value for each of these features uh, across the across the the row so for 21 in the age group 21 the least value for the patient ID was this number right here uh, the least number of pregnancy was zero um, the least number of uh, the least plasma glucose level was 44 um, the lowest BMI was 18.2 uh, lowest diabetes pedigree was 0 0.078 uh, lowest diabetes was zero or like uh, here you can see uh, basically that's that's what it does it gets a minimum for each, each of these things um, okay and then we can also go ahead and uh, apply multiple functions so you can see you can do min and we can do uh, max okay so now what this will do is it's gonna print for so for each of these columns it's gonna have sub columns so the in the age group 21 it'll go from the minimum uh, patient ID is this one and the maximum was this one for pregnancy the minimum number of uh, the so the least number of pregnancies in the 21 age group was zero and the maximum was 14 so some 14 year old had 14 pregnancies um, okay uh, so um, yeah and then like say this one diabetic obviously it's gonna be zero and one because there was surely yeah there was surely uh, somebody who's 21 who had uh, diabetes so I just say this so okay um, so that's the uh, that that's how you can apply multiple functions. Then uh, also, but we can so in the group by function itself, we can also group it by multiple. Um, we can group it by multiple features as well. So we can group it by, say for example, age and whether they are diabetic. So let's see what this will look like. I probably should have printed that in the list. Um, It, it'll take a little bit of time if we're running it like this, but normally it's pretty fast. So here you can see, so what it does is, uh, I'll show you in a second, but basically this is like uh, 77 and not diabetic, 76 and not diabetic, 75 and not di diabetic, so on. Um, and it keeps on going. And then if we keep on going up all the way beyond to the first one, then we'll see it'll say like say for example 71 77 and diabetic so it'll be a one right here instead of a zero um okay so what we can do with this is let's go ahead and delete that um okay so we can do this we can uh, aggregate this data as well so uh i'm going to aggregate by max and min again uh okay okay there we go so max and min so you can see right here, uh, uh, this is a more helpful way of seeing it, but what it does is it takes 21, and then it's gonna take first the people that are diabetic, and then the people that are not diabetic. So of people who are 21 and not diabetic, the, for example, maximum pregnancies was 11. Of people who are um, 21 and diabetic, that person was at uh, 14 pregnancies. Uh, note that this is, if you go across a row, this is not going to be the data for a single patient. This is going to be the value, the least and uh, greatest values across the all of the data. So, um, you know, don't think that this is a single patient that uh, we're talking about. It's going to kind of scramble the data up a little bit. Um, okay, uh, then uh, just uh, one more thing. So we're going to take this uh, same thing. But instead of putting in, um, so see here, it's gonna apply basically max and min functions on all of the features. But we can also go ahead and uh, aggregate specifically on a on a specific feature. So you want to feed in a dictionary to do that. So diabetes uh, pedigree, right? So we're gonna 
uh, go ahead and uh, go by diabetes pedigree. And so uh, what we'll do is we'll pass that uh, here we want to apply the max and the min functions, right? So, okay, what this does, let's take a look for a second. So what this does is it's going to look, so uh, the aggregate function will look at this and say, okay, uh, there's the dictionary, it has a diabetes pedigree, and the dia on the diabetes, diabetes pedigree, he wants me to apply the max and the min function. And then I could go ahead and go to the next one. Say, for example, if I want to look at the pregnancies again, right? Uh, I could say, uh, add right here pregnancies, uh, and then I'll go ahead and also apply, let's just say we want to get the max function, because min is probably going to be zero for a bunch of them. Um, except for the older age groups, but um, okay. So let's just say we want to apply the max function to this. So now, if we run this, you'll see it's only going to run. So on the uh, pregnancies, uh, we asked it to run uh, only the max function. So you can see it only applies the max function there. And on the diabetes pedigree, we asked it to apply the max and the min function. So you can see we I get the results from max and min functions. And again, it's grouping in the same group. So um, the age and then whether they're diabetic or not. And right here, you see that it's first it's age, then diabetic, but we could also reverse this and then it'll do opposite where first it'll show, uh, uh, the, so I can show you right here. So first it'll show uh, the diabetic and then it'll group it into the um, age group. So uh, let me just quickly show you uh, age. Okay, so you can see right here, first it goes into zero and then it does uh, and you can see how uh, what it, uh, Matplotlib, or sorry, not Matplotlib, uh, that's next week. Uh, what Pandas does by default is that it puts the dots here, so just to indicate that like the data is too long to print out. So it's just going to abbreviate it, but you can parse through the data if you want. You can apply the head function um, or something like that. So, okay, you can see right here, first it groups by whether they're diabetic, so 0 and 1. And then it's going to group within that group, it's going to create subgroups of the age, and then it'll provide us the function, the results from the functions that we asked it to apply from the aggregate function. Okay, so that's all we have for aggregate, uh, sorry, for a group by. Uh, so next thing is reshaping. So uh, there's a few functions that we can do for reshaping. It's not, um, it's not reshaping like NumPy, um, but basically you're uh, kind of like, uh, you'll see in a second, uh, you're kind of flat, um, stretching the data vertically or horizontally. So um, first is a melt function, and that's going to allow you to turn the columns into rows. So this is like stretching your data vertically. Uh, it'll make your data set taller. So OK, let's do diabetes uh, bf dot melt. Uh, so you can see what it does is it creates these columns variable and value. The index still remains like the index from zero to, you, you remember I told you it's it 15,000 data points, so four, zero to 14. Uh, oh, actually it looks like it's 150,000, never mind. Uh, okay, oh no, no, never mind. That's because it's the result of all of the thing. Anyways, okay, so uh, this is patient ID um, uh, and it's gonna have all of the so it'll basically have the first patient uh, right here. This is their patient ID. Then the second patient, their patient ID is this, right? So it'll go and list out all of the features for each of these variables. And this, and these are the values for that variable right here. So in this case, it's not really that useful. It'll basically just create bunch of columns, but we can specify exactly how we want it to, to melt the data set. So we can say ID vars equals patient ID. So and uh, value vars equals uh, and we'll put here, we'll put diabetic and we'll put the age. So Uh, and you'll see what this does in a second. So, okay, you can see, so here, it'll take the patient ID here on this side, and then over here, it'll do what it did before, where it's just, it's the patient ID and the, uh, does all of the features, but instead here, it just shows diabetic and it shows the age. Uh, so here, some of the, some of the data is still retained. Um, so we can see, 
uh, like for this patient right here, the uh, whether they were diabetic is, is false, right, is zero. Um, and then if you go down, you'll see their age and everything like that. Um, okay. So uh, this is also not particularly useful in this in this circumstance, but you know maybe for another situation you could use it. Um, okay, so now let's do the opposite of uh, melting. We're going to do pivoting. So uh, this one will make your data wider. Um, it'll stretch it horizontally. So we're going to pivot uh, columns. Uh, so we're going to uh, give the argument of columns as age, and we're going to give values as diabetes and you'll see this is diabetic and this is really not that useful in this case right here because yeah you'll see it'll just give basically the age is the columns right here right we specify columns as age and then the values right here is going to be whether or not they're diabetic this so the reason why this isn't very helpful here is because you would need data that's actually like this melted data um, and then it would kind of unfold it for you. Um, uh, and then you could, you know, put the values across the column and you could kind of see how the data reacts right here. Here, it's not very useful. You just see like the 21 year old was, had, had no diabetes. The 23 year old did have diabetes or didn't have diabetes either and so on. Um, so it's not very useful information. But um, if you had data where it was actually, it, it came folded, then you could use this to unfold the data, uh, and this would actually be very useful. Okay, so um, next, uh, this is gonna be the last thing, or second to last thing. So uh, we're gonna, remember I told you, so if I do di uh, doctors, uh, df dot head, okay. So you can see that this gives us the patient ID and the physician. Uh, but the patient IDs of this data set match up with that diabetes data set. Let me show you. Uh, so diabetes DF. Uh, so these patient IDs will match up with these patient IDs. But um, it's going to be really tedious to try and manually match the physicians up. So um, matplotlib has a way for us to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the, uh, for both of them, we're going to go ahead and set the index to the patient ID. Uh, you remember that we did this in the last one, so in the last lesson. So we're going to set it to the patient ID. Uh, and we're going to set in place to true, so that way um, it'll actually save it, the changes to the data set. So, okay, and then doctors df. So now if I go ahead and print this again, you can see the patient ID is directly the index. If I print this one again, again, patient ID is the index. Okay. So. Now that we have this, uh, what we can do is we can join these data, data sets together. So uh, we can do we use this function called pd.concat. So concatenate it, right? Um, and then we'll specify that we want to join concat together, concatenate together the diabetes data frame and the doctor's data frame. Okay. Also, we need to specify this other variable called axis, and we need to set it to one. Sorry, looks like I screwed something up. Um, doctor's data frame. Uh, shape of values pass is 15. Uh, okay, that ind indices imply 15,000 by 10. Looks like there's a size error. Um, let's see. Just for now, I'm going to try and do this kind of solution. Uh, let's see, what does it say? Raise construction error. Uh, there's a lot of errors. Um, pass indices so for you.
Do you know what might be going wrong? Uh, do I not set the index? Wait, what do you mean? Oh, like that. Uh, okay, yeah. Let me try this. So, okay, I set the. Okay, let me try that. Yeah, no, still some error. Um, let me maybe if I okay, let me try this. Uh, if I just go ahead and reset these, but I put the axis to zero. There we go. Okay. <laughs> That was, okay, I don't know why, they, um, I should actually change that in the other file. Okay, so there we go. Here, okay, so what this does is it's gonna set the, uh, so the patient IDs are now corresponding. So you can see right here, they have the physician. It appears that the, okay, so those 210 extra ones, um, those were in the diabetes data set because these first few patients don't have a physician. Um, so they are slightly different data sets, but these ones you can see they match up, right? Um, oh wait, okay, looks like they don't, um, they might have been completely different data sets, but, uh, okay. Basically, it'll match them up. If they, uh, did match up, they, they would match up. Uh, there might be some overlap, I don't know. Um, okay. So the reason why I put axis equals one is, uh, well, I did it wrongly, but, uh, I did the wrong way, but what, so this is axis equals zero. So what that means is it's going to concatenate going this way, right? So it's going to add an extra column to the new data set. And that's because that's done because the index is the same. So it'll match according to the index. Um, and so it's going to apply, attach this new column. And that's when axis is zero. Now when axis is one, what that means is that you have like, let's just say that you have two data sets with the same exact features of the diabetes, right? Uh, and so they have the same exact features like patient ID, pregnancies, plasma, glucose, um, diabetic, the diabetes pedigree, everything is all the same. Uh, then you just need to basically add the add those features in the rows at the end of the end, end of the data frame. Uh, then you would set the axis to one because then you're adding it going vertically. But when you're adding it horizontally, then you set the axis to zero, which it's zero by default. So yeah, okay. So last thing, so diabetes. Uh, Di uh, diabetes DF, we're going to reset the index. Uh, we're going to reset the index and set in place equals true. So diabetes DF dot head. Okay. So yeah, there we go. It's back to normal. Um, okay. So la last thing that we're going to do. So imagine if you're training a model on a machine learning model to see if the patient is diabetic based on this information, right? Uh, so that's the example I gave at the beginning. So now uh, you you realize that some of this data isn't really useful, and you want to try and so you want to try and optimize your data because the better your data is, the better your model is going to be. So like so say for example your patient ID your patient ID obviously obviously has nothing to do with if you're diabetic. And then maybe let's just say that we read some research that uh, proved that pregnancies uh, don't have anything to do with your risks of diabetes, right? I'm not sure if that's true, but let's just say for the sake of the example that, that it is true. Um, so then what we could do is we would, we would uh, want to remove these columns, right? So let me show you how we do that. So we use this function called the pop function. Uh, now this one, this function will actually do two things. It's going to remove that column and then it's also going to return it. But right now we don't need to store the column anywhere because, you know, this data isn't really useful to us. So I'm just going to pop that column patient ID. Uh, yeah, so you can see it returned that column. But again, it's not really very useful to us. Um, and then again, let's just say in the hypothetical situation, the pregnancies are not very useful information in this case. Then we can also go ahead and um, take off pregnancy. So now if I go ahead and print the head again, you'll see that the those two features are gone, right? So there's no uh, patient ID and there's no uh, there's no pregnancies, right? Uh, so it starts with plasma, glucose, diastolic, blood pressure, so on, right? Okay, last thing, uh, and also for some reason it printed weird, this is the di diabetic. Uh, you can see 0, 0, 1, 0. Uh, and this is the index right here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, I don't know why it printed like that. Um, because I guess because the size is too small. But anyways, 
So normally we'd calculate that. Anyway, so the last thing that we would probably want to do is uh, well, you're not going to input the, whether the patient is diabetic to the model because you're, uh, you know, you're already, like, if you're already giving them the data, um, <laughs> uh, if you're already giving them the data of whether they're diabetic, uh, the model, the data of whether it's diabetic, then what's the point of training your model? So uh, we can also remove the di diabetic feature, but this case, what we're going to do is we're going to actually store it. Uh, so I'll store it, store it in a series called diabetic. So we'll say diabetes uh, df dot pop uh, and diabetic. Okay. So now if I print diabetic, uh, you'll see that uh, it'll just give us a series of. Um, so patient zero has uh, no diabetes. Patient one has. Uh, has uh, no diabetes and so on, right? Uh, and so, then what we could do is we could train our model so it'll look at all these, all this information, and it'll make a prediction. Then we compare it to here to to see if it if it's correct or not. Uh, and then you know you punish the model or you know it depends on which algorithm you're using, but uh, the algorithm would be, get better eventually. Um, so yeah, that's uh, basically all we have for. Um, Pandas. Uh, I do encourage you to uh, try and you know research more about it, and uh, I'll also later I'll post this cheat sheet I found for pandas, um, so you can use that. That also has more functions that we didn't cover here as well, um, and then also like you can just try and read their documentation. It's online, um, in like docs.pandas.org or something, uh, and then you can also just use like the help function or everything like that to try and learn it. So. Uh, next, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, learn some command line uh, command line usage, uh, and also we're going to learn how to use uh, Anaconda, and we're going to learn how to use Jupyter. Okay, so uh, first, uh, let's see if we can see that. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, I think you guys can see that, right? Um, okay. So, okay, we're gonna, first I'm gonna show you some Anaconda commands. So, uh, Anaconda, you always use conda, that's the name of the command. Uh, and then you can, uh, okay, let's just say you wanna create uh, a new environment, right? Uh, so what is an environment? An environment is basically where you get to have, um, you, you basically get to have separate Python version and you get to have separate Python packages. So let me just give you an example. So TensorFlow, that's a library that is commonly used for machine learning. And uh, before, I think TensorFlow 2.0 released, uh, so in TensorFlow 1.x, whatever it was, uh, you could only, it only supported Python, I think like 3.5 or 3.6 only. Uh, but uh, the newest version was 3.7 and recently 3.8 came out. Actually, 3.9 came out, but anyways. So uh, if you had anything higher than 3.6, I'm pretty sure it's 3.6, but if you had anything higher than that, you would need to install the earlier version of Python in order to get, um, in order to get TensorFlow working, but uh, that would be pretty annoying. So what Anaconda allows you to do is to manage all these packages and Python versions into separate environments. So that way you can, like even if you're, like I have, uh, uh, well, not here. This is actually in an Anaconda environment. And you know that because I have, you see it right here, it says base. That's because it's the base Anaconda environment. But if I go ahead and, uh, so I'm gonna run this command, conda deactivate. That means it's gonna turn off the Anaconda environment. Uh, then if I run a Python dash V, you'll see I have Python 3.9.1. That's the Python running on my system. Um, and if I do a conda activate again, uh, it'll go back into the base Anaconda environment. And uh, sorry. Uh, there we go. Now I have Python 3.7.6 again, uh, and that's just a default Python environment. So now uh, let's. So let me show you how to create a new environment, right? So you could say conda create dash n, and then you want to say the name of the environment. So uh, let me just make sure I don't have any. Uh, let's see, conda uh, n list, I think. Uh, n list. Uh, let's see. Yeah, no, so I don't have, okay, so I'm just gonna create my env. 
Uh, and then, I don't know why that's, okay, anyways, so yeah, there we go. So Conda create uh, new, and we'll call it my environment, so my end, uh, and then we can specify the Python version. If you don't specify, I think it'll either use 3.7.6 for now, or it'll use the latest version, which is Python 3.9.1, as I showed you earlier. Um, so here, let's just say we want to use Python, um, I don't know, let's just try 3.6, right? Uh, so there we go. It's going to calculate, um, it's going to collect all the package data and everything. Uh, what the heck? There was some error happened. Uh, I don't know, maybe they discontinued that. Uh, so anyways, basically you get the idea. If uh, let's let me try like three point seven point six. Okay, there we go. So now, yeah, um, it'll give me the option to install this stuff. Uh, I mean, not the option, but I have to install this stuff if if I want to create the environment. So I'll just put yes. Uh, as you can see, it downloaded this stuff. Uh, executing transaction. There we go. So now. You can see right here, it tells you to activate this environment, use conda activate my env to deactivate, conda deactivate. So uh, if I do conda activate my env, okay. So now if I have, uh, so now let's just say on my regular base environment, right? Um, so let me just zoom in a little bit, okay. So, okay, on my base environment, I have, uh, if I open IPython, right? Well, actually, just let's just take IPython, right? So IPython is a package you would install separately. So on my base, on my base environment, I do have IPython installed. But if I try and do it here, oh, actually, it looks like it does start by default. Um, okay, oh, okay. Let's just say I wasn't in uh, IPython, and if I try to import panda, pandas. Okay, there we go. So now, wait, what the heck is going on? Uh, import numpy. Oh, it's because it's still, okay. It's because it's, okay, that's why. Okay, there we go. Now this is the correct version of Python. So if I go and if I just type in Python here, there we go, okay. Now if I import pandas here, you can see it works. If I try to import pandas here, there we go. Now it says module not found, right? So the reason for that is because in my base environment, I installed pandas, right? Um, but, uh, uh, okay. But in this environment, I it's it's a brand new environment, so I haven't installed. Okay, I haven't installed pandas. So what I can do is I can say, so you can either do pip install pandas, or you can say conda install pandas. Either way works. I'll just do conda install pandas. Um, so yeah, I'll just put yes. Uh, so it'll download pandas. It'll get all the dependencies and it's going to install it. There we go, done. So now if I do Python again, uh, import pandas, uh, there we go. So you can see that it works. Um, okay, so that's uh, pandas. And then now, okay, so I can conda, well actually Jupyter is going to take a little while. So I'm just going to conda deactivate. Uh, so now I'm in a base environment. Uh, so I'm going to start a Jupyter notebook. So this is how you start a Jupyter notebook. So you say Jupyter notebook. Uh, and then there you go. It'll start it. Uh, now this opened up actually on my other browser window, but I'll bring that over here. Uh, right here. Let me just zoom in for you guys. Uh, okay. There we go. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that. Um, okay. So I'll zoom in a little bit more and okay, there we go right here. So if I go to projects and I can go to this crash course and pandas uh, and you can see right here, this is like, okay, this is a data set that we had before. Uh, this is a CSV, right? Um, this is the pandas lesson that we had right here. Um, okay, but now let's just say that I wanted to create uh, a new notebook. So now, there you go, I created a new notebook, right? Um, okay, so there we go, right here. So now I can do my coding in here. So let me just open up this, well, let me do this. I'm gonna minimize this right here so we just get this. Uh, and 
Let me zoom in a little bit more. No. Okay. So I'm going to run this program called uh, Screen Key, and that'll allow you to see the key by hand. <laughs> so there we go. Okay. So I can. So here's what I'm going to do. This is a code cell, right? Right now by default. So let's just say, okay, I want to import pandas as pd, right? Okay. So now the way to run, uh, the way to run one of these cells is to hit Shift Enter. So you can see right here, Shift Enter, and that's gonna that ran that cell. Now if I say, um, I don't know, dir p, right? There we go. Now we get an output of all of the functions and classes that are in the in, in pandas, right? Uh, and then I can say like uh, pd dot Okay, that's a bit. Okay, there we go. PD dot read CSV, uh, and I can do. I'm pretty sure I'm in the same. Let us dive this CSV, uh, and there we go. So you can see I get all of my data right here. Um, okay. So yeah, that's how you use code cells. Um, but then you can also have different kinds of cells. So uh, I can set the cell type to markdown. So this is called a Jupyter Notebook, right? So, um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm waiting for this dialog to get away. Actually, I can just go ahead and kill. Okay, there we go. Now that thing's gone. Okay, so uh, what I can do is um, I can make a markdown cell here so I can uh, you, you can learn Markdown language. It's a completely different language. I, I, I personally don't really know it, but uh, you can say, uh, for example, um, this is sorry, this, this, looks like, okay, this is a new um, I don't know, column or something. Uh, and I run that. There we go. Now that's a new part of the thing. Uh, is my internet down? Okay, there we go. Um, Okay, so yeah, there you go. That's basic stuff. Uh, you can, so you can run code blocks and you can have these markdowns and that'll just help you stay organized. Um, I think you can also just, so like, okay, let's just set this to a markdown again. Um, okay, so now I can just type like, uh, you know, regular text. I run this cell and it does regular text <coughs> instead of the monospaced font. Uh, this is just, again, Jupyter Notebooks, it's a notebook, so this allows you to create notes and everything like that. Um, okay, so last thing I want to cover is, uh, and I know I'm probably running a little bit over time, but um, there's only two people, so uh, uh, last thing I'm going to uh, cover is going to be, um, is going to be, uh, let me shut down the server, okay. So the last thing I want to cover is just some basic command line usage. Uh, and so this is mainly applying to uh, Linux, or I guess if you have Mac, that'll like basically Unix based operating systems. Uh, some of these commands will probably work on Windows. If you want, uh, what you can do is uh, so I set up this service right here. So if you go to uh, shell.poundview.ml, um, then you can go ahead and uh, log into here. Uh, if you, oh, one second, one second. okay, there we go. So I logged in. Uh, so this is basically what it does: is it's just gonna uh, connect you to my to my desktop. Uh, and so um, if you want to try this out, um, you can. Uh, you you're gonna need the username and the password. So if you just DM me on Discord, I can give that information to you. Um, so you can see right here, uh, actually I may as well just uh, show you through here. So, okay, let me just, okay. So uh, first commands I'll show you is like ls, right? So, uh, sorry, actually I need to, okay. <laughs> I kind of use this for personal things, but uh, okay. ls is the first thing, right? So. Uh, you'll see that in when you install Anaconda, it'll create this Anaconda 3 folder. Uh, so you can um, CD into folders, which stands for change directory, right? LS is for list, 
and cd is for change directory so i can cd into the anaconda 3 folder right so you can see now it says anaconda 3 um, uh, let me just clear the screen uh, okay so you can see that this has all the anaconda stuff in it um, and then if you want to cd outside you can go ahead and cd dot dot you can cd out one more time you can even so if i cd if you just type in like regular cd it'll take you back to your home folder and the way you know you're in your home folder is because of this tilde uh, tilde tilde means that you're at your home directory uh, so if I'm at like I don't know cd slash etsy slash uh, I don't know what, else, what is it uh, slash I don't know Bluetooth right uh, okay so if I'm right here uh, I can type cd and it'll take you to my home directory so and if you want to see where you're where you are you can type in pwd and so you'll, it'll show you that I'm at slash home slash guest, right? Uh, so the, and if I go to CD slash, this is the root directory. So this is where all of this stuff um, is basically. So every single folder on the computer stems from this root directory. Uh, so if I CD, sorry, uh, CD to home, uh, you can see that here, this is my account. Um, and this is the guest account that I set up for this purpose. Um, so because this is my personal desktop so okay I can CD into guest and uh, you can see that I bring this stuff back up so now I'm back at home and you can see that it shows the tilde again um, okay so if you're so like I can CD outside multiple times and I'll be back at root because uh, this first one will take me to the slash home directory this one will take me to the root and this one is just redundant but it takes me back to the home uh, okay so now I can go ahead and, uh, so if I look at the PWD, it's still the slash directory, right? Um, now let's, so let me show you this. So if you wanna, let's just say, I wanna see what's inside of my home directory, or inside the guest home directory, right? Uh, I can say ls slash home slash guest. And so then without CDing, I can go ahead and see what's in that directory. Um, and then uh, I can also just, again cd back home uh, you can also cd so like if you're back at root then you can say okay i want to cd to my home and then anaconda 3 directory okay uh, and then that'll take you to the uh to the anaconda directory from the root so you don't have to go slash home slash guest slash anaconda 3 you can just go directly you can just directly put a tilde and it'll take you there uh what else so i can also show you okay so let's just say you're in your home directory right um, so now you want to like uh, make a directory, let's just say, uh, I don't know, my directory, right? Uh, okay, so now I can, so that's how you make a directory, so mkdir for make dir. So I can cd into my directory, uh, and there's going to be nothing here, right? Now let me show you a few more things on ls. So you can do ls-l and dash a, and so, okay, let me show you what those are. So if I go, so if I go right here and I do ls-l, you'll see that this gives me some information. So you can see that this D right here means that this is a directory. So Anaconda, is, this is a directory. This will tell me when it was created. So this was created in September 4th of 2020. Uh, you'll see the these are the permissions. So read and write, uh, read, write, and execute for this one, although you can't really execute a folder. Uh, and then this is read. Uh, and so this is for the root, right? So the first one, this means that the root user which is like the administrator, can read, write, and execute this file, uh, or this directory. Although uh, this one is actually something you can execute because this is an executable file. Um, and then uh, this means that the uh, the guest group, so whenever every single user has a group and a user, so the guest group can read and, well, they can't really execute because you can see this isn't lit up. And then the guest user itself, which is me right now, uh, can read and execute this file and then this just gives you so this is like 76 uh, I think that's I don't know if that's kibibytes or kilobytes um, um, but yeah something like that um, so anyways then uh, now so that's ls-l but you can also add an a that'll show you hidden files right so that's like uh, so hidden files are files with dots those don't traditionally appear but if you do ls-a that'll show you and I can put these together ls-al 
uh, and that'll show me basically all the files on this in this directory, all the files and folders, and it'll give me some basic, uh, and it'll also show the hidden files, right? That's what the A flag is for. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. So I did ls, I did cd, I did pwd. Uh, so that's basic navigation. Uh, now let's go back to cd to miter. Um, okay, so you can see there's nothing here. If I do actually ls dash uh, l dash al, uh, there's actually still nothing. Uh, Normally, you would print like a dot and a dot dot, which represents the, the. So, dot, if I do like cd dot, that means. So, dot points back to the directory that you're in right now. Um, you would typically use that if you're trying to execute a file, like if I. Uh, let's see right here. So, this game, it's lit up green, which means that it's, a, it's an executable file. Uh, so, I can write, write uh, dot slash game, and that'll execute the game file. Okay. Uh, so now I can cd to my directory. Uh, okay. Well, okay. You can see right here I did a I misspelled it because it is case sensitive and Windows I don't think it's case sensitive, but in uh, Unix based operating system it is case sensitive. Uh, and so I tried to cd into uh, my dir with a capital I, but uh, this is bash and it's a little bit smart. I think I activated some setting or something in there. So it automatically corrects me to miter, uh, which is the one that I want to go to. So uh, now I can go ahead and create a file by saying touch, and then, I don't know, let's just say uh, test.txt, right? So now I have test.txt in here, and I can, so you can use, on here I've installed some few different editors. I think I have uh, NeoVim, well actually NeoVim, yeah, that's my default, so you can use that. Uh, you can use, um, all right, you can just use regular vim. Uh, there we go. This is regular vim. Actually, I, uh, you should probably use regular vim because I configured it for regular vim. Uh, so, sorry to actually. Oh shoot! Uh, I'm stuck in a loop because of my browser. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna go ahead and restart. Uh, okay. So, sorry about that. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, if I cd back into my directory, uh, also you can use tabs, uh, tab. The tab key will auto-complete it for you, so uh, that's just a quick shortcut you can do. So uh, the one that, so see Vim has like a steep learning curve if you're brand new at it. So if you're just starting off, I wouldn't recommend using Vim, uh, but I installed this other one called Micro. So if you micro test.txt, uh, you can see this kind of gives you like a, uh, this is easier to use for you because you can just, it just uses regular commands. So you can like, uh, this is a file. Okay, and then you can press uh, Control Q to exit. Uh, and it'll ask you, do you want to save changes? So I'll just say yes. Uh, then there's this other command called cat, which allows you to print their what's in a file. Uh, so test.txt. Uh, so there you go, it prints out that this is a file. If you want to remove a file, you can say rm uh, test.txt. Uh, you can see that that will remove the, direct, uh, the, remove the file. Uh, finally, if you want to remove a Directory, you can say, uh, you can also say rm dir, my dir, or you can say um, rm dash r for recursive, so that'll delete the folder as well as all the files in the folder. And then you can also add an f, which forces it to delete that, so you can see that that directory is gone now. Um, let's see, I think that's all. Can you think of anything else? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's all. I mean, there's a ton of more stuff you can do in the terminal, but uh, I just wanted you guys to get um, more accustomed to the terminal as well. Uh, so yeah, that's all. Uh, uh, and I can just exit out of here. Um, log out. Okay. So yeah, that's all. Um, okay. Thanks for joining and uh, have a nice weekend.